Fox Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us for Newsmaker Saturday. We're going to talk education with a local superintendent later in the program, but we begin with one of the announced candidates for U.S. Senate here in Arizona. He's a five-term congressman representing Arizona's third congressional district. That includes most of southern, western, and downtown Phoenix, along with a portion of Glendale. He's a former Marine who served in Iraq, 3rd Battalion, which suffered the most casualties in the Iraq conflict. Congressman Ruben Gallego joins me now on Newsmaker Saturday. Great to see you, Congressman. Good to see you, John. I appreciate you coming on the program. Uh, President Biden was in the Grand Canyon this week, uh, and it seemed like all the Democrats were there, and including former Democrat, now independent, Kirsten Sinema. You were not there. Why? Well, I got to greet the president of the tournament, but it actually was my son's first day uh, of school. And, uh, you know, I'm committed to having a good work-life balance. Uh, as you know, I didn't have much of a father growing up, and I'm, uh, you know, trying to make sure that, uh, you know, I change the ways. And so was very happy to be at my son's first day, but had a great opportunity to have a discussion with the president at the tarmac uh, when he landed in the Grand Canyon. You, uh, you just recently had a daughter, Isla, so now yeah. you've got two. Yeah. Um, you took a paternity leave from Congress. That's a little bit unusual. Uh, but it, it is interesting that you're making these kind of choices, as you said, because you didn't have some of this as a child. Exactly. And also, every Arizona should have the same opportunity I, that I had. I was able to take uh, one month of paternity leave, but most Arizonans don't actually have paternity leave, don't get paid paternity leave. A lot of women have to go back to work just, you know, weeks after having a baby. And, and for those of us that have kids, you know how hard uh, that is, both on the family and on the kid. Uh, and so I am blessed and I, am, I have the privilege of doing that. But I, you know, I recognize that this is something that needs to be extended to everyone else. But I, I, it is important. Um, you know, I wanted to make sure that I was there for uh, my spouse. I was there for my baby, for my son. Uh, and it's something that, you know, I learned the hard way. And I want to make sure that uh, going to the future, uh, you know, I, I'm a set of good example for my son and for my daughter. So being up there with the president was not a big thing on your list. You'd rather do that. And, and as you know, the president is struggling in Arizona. He's 17 points underwater on favorability. Um, where do you think this is going? Because he's he's got some struggles. He's got some challenges right now. Well, you know, I wouldn't say they didn't want to be there. Look, when you're in office, you have to make decisions all the time about what's important in time for yourself, your constituents, and your family. And uh, this is one of those rare times where I just had to make sure that I made time for my family first, because I'm not going to get that first day of school back uh, ever again, or I'm not going to get the first month uh, back uh, with my newborn ever again. So this is a family choice, not necessarily a uh, decision on, uh, you know, on where the president is. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, I believe I'm strong enough as a candidate that I, you know, will do and be able to do what I need to to win, uh, whether or not, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, up visiting somebody for one hour uh, in the Grand Canyon. Congressman, how concerned are you with these revelations that the Biden family was making? Now the report is maybe upwards of $20 million in what some are describing as influence peddling overseas to some pretty unsavory characters. The evidence seems to be mounting. And the president doesn't seem to want to address it. Would you urge him to address this? Or are you concerned he doesn't have a great answer? Uh, I'm not concerned at all. Um, you know, clearly, um, um, uh, younger Hunter Biden uh, did things illegally. There's a reason why he is being uh, uh, going to court. Uh, I think there is nothing uh, at all in terms of what the president did himself. He's clear that he was not involved uh, in any way in Hunter's business. Uh, Hunter may have done a lot of things to influence uh, other people, but there's nothing there there, and there has nothing been proven at all by this uh, committee. Uh, and I think it's interesting that Republicans now care about potential influence peddling when you had uh, Donald Trump and all his kids, as well as some of his kids that were still in office, uh, using their, their name and title to promote their businesses. But what I see right now is uh, much ado about nothing. It's a way to distract uh, the country. Uh, and it, it, you really it, believe it, that? It I mean, the, the, the well. bank records are now starting to come in and it I, I mean, any any journalist who looks at this uh, from a distance just objectively would say this doesn't look right. I mean, it, it appears in Devin Archer testified. No, hold on. Let me no finish. Hold on. Let me finish. The that Devin Archer, Devin Archer said that the hold on the brand that was being sold. And this is just, again, more. 
uh, more propaganda that's being pushed by some. I don't, I don't know that we can call it propaganda anymore, Congressman. I really don't. They want to distract the country. I, I don't know that we can call it propaganda anymore. I mean, people are testifying now that this was selling the Biden brand. I, I don't know how you get around this. Well, very simple. There is nothing uh, that the president did that's illegal. He's never claimed uh, that he was involved in the business. And again, this is being pushed by the most extreme elements of the Republican Party to distract from the fact they have a very weak uh, presidential candidate who right now is being uh, prosecuted by four different political entities. Okay, let, let me just run one by you. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, very liberal senator, she said today that she's concerned about this. She's one of the first to come out and say it, and she's really concerned about influence peddling in Washington on the larger scale. She thinks that this is kind of a nasty industry going on in Washington. What have you seen, what have you observed back there, and are you worried about it? Well, I think influence peddling is an issue, uh, has been for quite a while. I'm running against somebody that has been, uh, you know, very involved in with a lot of, uh, I would say, lobbyists and special interests. But at the same time, uh, what we're asking uh, specifically is whether this is an impeachable offense for a president, and it's not, because he was not involved in that. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to reform uh, Washington, D.C., uh, but coming up with sham uh, prosecutions against a sitting president uh, when there is nothing there, I think is just a distraction again done by the most extreme Republicans uh, in Congress. The polling now shows a majority of Americans do believe that there's something amiss with the Biden family. Um, you need coattails in, in next year's election to win this thing. Are you concerned that Joe Biden age this, that he may not be the, the right guy to carry the party over the finish line? Are you, are you concerned about this? I don't need coattails. I can run my uh, election. I have one of the strongest candidates the state's ever going to has ever seen. I will be able to pull uh, Democrats uh, out to vote, get in crossover independent voters, and even some moderate Republicans because of you know my stances and where I believe are more aligned with the other than the other two Senate candidates. Uh, so I'll be helping the ticket more than anything else. And we're going to run a running campaign, and we don't need anyone to help us. How do you believe a three-way race, if Kirsten Sinema were to run, she's filed paperwork, but she hasn't formally announced. How do you see that shaking out? You've, you've got um, Sheriff Lamb is in on the Republican side. Carrie Lake is rumored to maybe jump in. It looks likely. Uh, how do you see that shaking out? Uh, the way I see shaking out is me winning. There's every public poll, every private poll has me coming in first place in a, in a uh, three-way race, uh, in a two-way race. Uh, so we're not worried. We're running a great campaign. My values are more aligned with Arizona values than the dangerous ones that Kerry Lake represents or the ones that uh, Kirsten Sinema represents. So we are very confident. We work hard. And at the end of the day, we're going to win no matter what. And uh, the other candidates need to figure out what they want to do. But uh, we're not afraid. You've been traveling around the state holding town halls. What are your voters, what are voters most concerned about? What are they telling you is job one? Well, job one is they want someone who's, you know, answerable, accountable, and and there. Uh, I think they feel that they've been forgotten, uh, that their elected officials, you know, do, they do not show up. They don't do town halls. They do not. They don't communicate well, what they're doing and why they're doing it. They want us to focus on some very serious uh, things. For example, water is extremely important that people, every town hall I have, it always comes up. We talk about also about standard of living in Arizona. It's very expensive to live in Arizona. It's hard to buy a home. It's hard to uh, really live the good American dream here in Arizona. And we need to start working uh, on that. And then lastly, you uh, can't avoid it because it, it is an issue that comes up all the time and something that we have to work on is immigration. We need comprehensive immigration reform. We need to have control over the borders, but we need to do it in a way that I think we'll be proud of that actually deals in the long term with a long term solution to our border problems. This border issue right now, does it trouble you that you see people kind of coming in unfettered? I think it's always a problem when you see chaos anywhere within our government and the border. There has been some better improvement, obviously, there uh, in the last couple of months. But what we need to do is have a transparent uh, and predictable way for people to apply to come to this country uh, and seek asylum for those that want to seek it. I don't think they, it has to be at the border. I think you should be able to do it in other parts uh, of either from their home country or from uh, you know another third country. Uh, I also think that we need to have a flexible way for get, to get guest workers here so they could come here legally and not pay coyotes. Uh, and then we also have to work with um, 
uh, the undocumented and DACA recipients that are here and have and put them on a pathway uh, to uh, citizenship. And of course, then give the resources to our uh, secure border security uh, to make sure that they can uh, uh, keep the border safe. Why, by doing that, by allowing people to come here in a legal manner, it relieves some of that pressure that I think is of being seen at the border. Congressman, finally, since you served, and you served in a rough theater, you lost your best friend. We are having trouble right now attracting people to the military. Do you think that there may come a day where we need a draft again? No, I don't think it's the case. Uh, the problem that we have right now is that if you want to get a job that pays $18 an hour with benefits, you can go down to your local Taco Bell or your grocery store. The average uh, PFC or private makes uh, close to, I would say, $13 an hour. And so a lot of these young men and women are looking at the situation and they financially don't see the benefit. Number two, they also look at how other veterans have been treated. And when, the reason we need to make sure that the VA is fully staffed and treating our veterans well is because younger military personnel or people that are of military age that want to join will look and say, why would I want to join? Because at the end of the day, I'm not going to be taken care of. So making sure that the VA takes care of veterans is the way to actually make sure that we have more people uh, or people continue to be encouraged uh, to join uh, the military. Congressman, I always appreciate you coming on the program. From the heart, you know, there are some Democrats who see the Fox logo and they just don't want to come on. Um, and you always have, and I can't tell you how much we appreciate that. Not a problem, John. It's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the John logo, that John Hook logo, that really attracts me. But <laughs> please invite me back when you have a chance. Well, we do go way back. And, and thank <laughs> you again for your service to the country. And, and I appreciate having you on. It's great to see you. Have a good one. Okay. Congressman Gallego, when we come back, uh, back to school right now. Kids are heading back in Arizona. We're going to speak with a new superintendent on the, in the Tolleson District about falling enrollments in public schools, lagging test scores, and ideas on how to protect students and teachers on campus when we come back. Back on Newsmaker Saturday, the school year for many in Arizona is already in full swing, and there are so many issues surrounding schools in this state. Vouchers, what's being taught in the classroom, bilingual education, a persistent but improving teacher shortage. We thought we'd check in with Tolleson Union High School District Superintendent Jeremy Caius. Jeremy, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. Okay, now in Tolleson, you guys have University High, Westview, Tolleson Union High School, Copper Canyon High School, La Jolla Community High School, correct? You've got five. Uh, John, actually, we have uh, seven high schools in Tolleson. I believe uh, you may have left off Tolleson High and Sierra Linda. Oh, I did miss Sierra Linda. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I apologize. <laughs> but you've got your hands full. You were telling me before we started uh, rolling here that you actually don't have a lot of teacher vacancies right now. That's a little bit of an outlier statewide. Absolutely, John. We are fortunate that even though we have 659 teaching positions, we only have five vacancies right now. And, and a few of those five just recently occurred. So it's, it's, we're pretty well staffed here in Tolleson. What is the biggest challenge in Tolleson for you with these high schools? And the, and the whole district is high schools, right? Absolutely, John. We're, we're 14,000 students, all high schools. Uh, we are seeing amazing growth here in the West Valley. Uh, managing to that growth has been somewhat difficult. We are waiting for the State School Facilities Board to give us approval on our next new high school to construct over on the corner of Dysert and Broadway. And in the meantime, we have a couple of our schools that are running over capacity, while some of our schools may have some space, and that's because the state formula requires that the district as a whole is out of capacity before we get that approval to move forward with the construction. I suspect in Tolleson you have a fair amount of Spanish speakers primarily in your schools. Is that correct? Yes, John, that is correct. Okay, we had Superintendent of Public Instruction Tom Horn on last week, and we were talking about this. He is really fighting to keep instruction primarily in English unless a school has a waiver to have bilingual or dual language learning. What is your experience in Tolleson? What are you guys doing and what works? 
Yes, John, so we, we don't have a dual language program, uh, but we do have ELL, so for English limited learners. And, and we are working with our community to make sure that we bridge that gap. Uh, we try to be cognizant of the needs of our community. So typically when we do send out communication, knowing that we may have family members at home who only speak Spanish, we make sure that we are translating and providing that that Spanish version of the documentation that we sent home. You know, the, the old argument has been that if a kid primarily speaks, let's say Spanish, that's their native language, that if you force them into, into English all the time, they start to fall behind at least early in math and other subjects. Their English may start to get better, but they may fall behind in other ways. What's been your experience? Yes, John. So in, in in my experience, a lot of that occurs at the at the elementary levels, and we're only instructing in high school out here in Tolson. So we just have grades nine through twelve. Uh, we do still have a portion of our population that is English limited learners, and we have a great program that helps make that connection for them, so that we make sure that the content is still getting across and delivered to the student. So for the kids who need it, you can still do it. You still, but you have to file for a waiver with the state to do it. John, I believe the, the waiver is only on a dual language program. Uh, so we're not actually offering a dual language program. Uh, all of our instruction is in English, but we have, we have uh, as all districts do in the state, we have a, a program around English limited learners that provide that extra support, as we would provide extra supports in other areas when they're needed. Do you think it makes sense to teach kids who speak other languages, primarily English, to get them proficient. Tom Horn's argument is that if they're going to succeed in this country, they've got to have their arms wrapped around the English language. Yes, I, I think it's it's both. Uh, you know, we, we make sure that they're becoming English proficient. So our program makes sure that we get them on track to become English proficient. However, we also, in the meantime, while you're helping them get to that English proficiency, we have to make sure that they're learning the content. So. It, it, it's it's you know these students are are bright students that are doing two things at the same time they're they're adapting and learning the new language while also still learning the content and the beauty of that is they end up they end up multilingual which is terrific bilingual absolutely i think that's a a very important trait for them to have when they do enter the workforce to not only be proficient in all courses but then also to have that bilingual status so when they go out into a global economy and have to work with a diverse workforce they're already prepared for that okay a couple of other things i wanted to talk to you about um, a study released earlier this year showed that students during the pandemic lost about 35 percent of a normal school year's worth of learning how are you guys trying to bring kids back and, and make up that ground? Yes, John, it, it's really dependent on the student themselves. And so we're trying to get into more personalized learning for those students. So that way we can see what each student needs and, and try to address those needs. We've looked at a variety of ideas. Uh, one thing that we are exploring right now is, is leveraging AI to help assist in several areas. One of those is with scheduling to help make sure that we get more customized scheduling, personalized to the individual student so they're getting what they need. Uh, but we also have a team that we've expanded our social and emotional uh, learning support. So we have a team that, that helps to identify when we have those needs to be able to work with that student and, and help transition the student back into, uh, you know, the, the pre-pandemic education life. Uh, as well as we still offer distance learning for all of our students. So for any student who still prefers to be online, that they've, they've gotten acclimated to the online environment, they want to continue online education, that continues to be one of our offerings through our distance learning academy. You, no surprise, I mean, you just started, you just came on in July, but you know the numbers, but I'm going to run them by you. Your graduation rate in the Tolleson Union High School District is 89% but your proficiency in reading is 22% and your proficiency in math is 14%. I have a couple of questions. Number one, how do you graduate a kid if they're 22% proficient in reading and 14% proficient in math? I'm, I'm always curious about this because it, it strikes me those numbers tell you they're not ready. 
Absolutely, John, and I couldn't agree more. One of the first things that I did uh, as I as I took this position was to approach my governing board and to let them know that we needed a curriculum audit. We needed to get down to the reasons why we're not seeing higher proficiency, and we're bringing in West Ed. The governing board just approved last night a contract for West Ed. Um, it's it's going to run us close to a million dollars. They're going to come in and do an in-depth study. This is a professional organization that works nationwide. They are going to do an in-depth study, and they're going to help us identify how we increase the proficiency. And 89% isn't acceptable. We want 100% graduation. So we're looking at how do we increase proficiency and increase that graduation rate. I got to commend you, Superintendent. You didn't duck it. You just dove right into it, and and you didn't you didn't seem offended by the question. You said, "Look, we got a problem. We got to fix it." Absolutely, our community deserves better and we intend to do better for our community. Okay, I'm very curious. You guys are really leaping into AI. You mentioned it before on how to kind of try to model your scheduling, tailoring it to the student. But you've also taken this on when it comes to securing your campus. You believe AI can be a help in keeping the campus safe and you've leaned into it. Absolutely, John. When I look at AI, that is a tool that we need to leverage. That is that is where the future is headed. That is where the future is now. Uh, when we're looking at AI in regards to safety right now, AI can detect a gun when it is on campus and alert our staff immediately. AI can detect crowd patterns and let us know when a fight is about to occur. I want to be able to break up that fight before the first punch is thrown. I don't want cameras that are reactive and we're looking at a fight after it's already occurred and trying to sort out who's getting suspended. I want, to, I want to save all those kids from being suspended. If we can stop the fight before it happens, nobody has to be suspended. How do you feel about, how do you feel about having an officer on campus or officers? Absolutely, John. We have an officer on every single one of our campuses. Uh, we have uh, our SROs are working closely with our students. They, they you know, provide classes for our students. They talk with our students. They know our students. They're on a first name basis with our students. We, we embrace SROs on our campus. On one of our campuses, we even have two SROs. Superintendent Caius, um, one of the big issues right now in Arizona is enrollment in traditional public schools. It is dropping. I think we hit a high water mark up around almost a million kids. Now we're down in the 800,000s. This goes against all the, the legislative uh, budget people projections that thought we'd be at a million six in traditional public schools toward the end of the decade. We're, we're going an opposite way, and at the same time, charter school enrollment is climbing. What is happening out there? School choice seems to have changed the entire dynamic. Yes, John, I would agree with that, that uh, ever since the mid-90s, when we went into this, this realm of charter schools and school choice, it did change the dynamic. Now, there are still a lot of work that we need to do in those areas. So when we look at charter schools right now, they're not being held to the same levels of accountability that we have for school districts. There's some improvements we can make in that area. So it's it's not just making sure that we have a lot of choices, it's making sure that we have all quality choices. And so I'd, I'd like to see the state move into that area. Now here in Tolleson, uh, while we do have some charter schools available here in Tolleson, uh, Tolleson is still a growing district. Uh, we just added West Point uh, just you know, four years ago, and West Point already has over 3,000 students, and we're we're in the middle of designing to build another new high school. So wow. in Tolleson, we are the opposite of the trend. Final thing, um, we we just did a story this week on Cartwright School District in Maryvale. They're going to a four-day school week to attract teachers. Good or bad idea in your view? John, while I'm not completely familiar with all the reasoning behind why Cartwright decided to make that choice, uh, I'll just say that it's not a choice that I'd be making for, for our school district. Uh, I want more instruction. I want more instruction. I want more professional development for teachers. I want more resources for teachers. Uh, I'm, I'm actually floating an idea with my governing board already to have the first 12 month teaching contract. So right now, wow. we were the first district to reach $60,000 as a starting base for teachers fresh out of college. So we're the only district to break 60,000 mark. Uh, and that's in addition to that, they get 4,000 for performance pay. We're looking at a 12 month contract. I think teaching is becoming a full year job and, and we need to start moving into that direction. Superintendent Caius, I appreciate your time. Um, I think based on our interview, they're lucky to have you. <laughs> you are leaning in to all of these challenges. 
Well, I, I appreciate I appreciate that, John. And I guess only time will tell if uh, if you can have me back about four years from now to commend us on being the best district in the state. Then I'll agree with you on that comment. I hope we do it before then. How about that? Oh, thank you. I'd appreciate okay. that even better. Superintendent Caius, Jeremy Caius, Tolleson Union High School District. Thank you very much. We'll be back in a moment on Newsmaker Saturday.